Teddy Talks With features Mario C. Bauer in conversation with the stars of the F&B industry. Join Mario and his guests as they explore what motivation, success and most importantly, love for food mean. Because in life, only two things matter. Love and food. Learn more on www.teddytalkswith.com. So welcome today at the Daddy Talks at the Beef Bar Paris. And this is one of the, the nicest places. And obviously, it's one of the best looking guys here. So <laughs> thanks, Ricardo, for having us. Thank you very much. I know you. that this is a special day. It's a little bit crazy here. We have an event yes. tonight. And yes. we're going to talk about that later. But first of all, in the preview, the guys saw this amazing place because we were allowed to shoot here. Yes. So where are we? Maybe you tell us a little bit about this so, unique place. I mean, what we what are, is it here? We are actually in the heart of Paris. We Rue Marbeuf. Yeah, Rue Marbeuf. This is Rue du Bocador, and that's Rue George, Avenue Georges V, so the most iconic street of the 8th arrondissement, okay. with, between the Champs Elysees and Avenue Montaigne. So what we call the Golden Triangle of Paris. So this room we used to be a the dining room of a hotel situated on Avenue Georges V. Uh, in, and it was built in the years 1897 to 1898. Oh my God. So we're so sitting all, in history. Well, you will, I'll talk about it later, but this is all semi-real. I have to say why it's semi, because it has been, um, this, this, actually this room has such a great history. So it was open at the hotel. The hotel was doing okay. And uh, when the Second World War uh, erupted, unfortunately, uh, the French resistance did not want this room to be seen by the Nazis. And so they put a wall Actually, the, the whole the wall was we were hiding it. Were, were, were over there, in order for them to hide the room so that they wouldn't be seen or it wouldn't be even brought down or whatever. Because it's it's really like a mini uh, Grand Palais. Yeah, it's, 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 it's impressive. We will talk about design later because I know that how important it is. But first of all, I like to travel back a little bit okay. to li little Ricardo. When you grow up in, 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 in your family, because now it's all about food and your lifestyle, how important was food with your parents when you grow up? Tell us a little I bit. I have to be honest with you, it was actually played. very important. Uh -huh. uh, Where did you grow up? I lived in, grew up in Monaco. Okay. I was born in Italy, but my parents were already resident when I was there. So I did one of grade one in, in Italy and then I moved to Monaco. And uh, my mother is actually a great cook. Mm -hmm. So my mother cooked every dish, lunch and dinner. She was a, housewife and you know like Italian style but she's English so I got really into the um, I really got into the, um, the, the the food world through her, her cooking which is you know very family style and very simple food but actually very uh, even today when I see what I give my children I'm very embarrassed so compared to that I mean I, I must give a lot of credit to her and then your dad, what was he doing? Well, well dad was working. <laughs> he <laughs> was not so often in the house. He came for dinner. Okay. We, all the four of us, my sister, my mother, and my father would eat. And my mother would cook. And uh, and when when was it clear for you that you do something in that field? So when did you hear the, the calling well, or to say I do restaurants uh, now? Uh, well, it wasn't really a calling. I, w I was always obliged psychologically by my father to take over his business. So for me, I never had a choice of what I had to do. I had to follow my father's trail, even though I didn't want to, I didn't like it. I found out later Your I did father not. Is a, is a meat, meat importer, meat mm -hmm. trader, and I've done, I've done another company and, and I've started branding beef. And, uh, he so you started he, from the food side, not from the restaurant side. It started from the food side. And mm -hmm. then the only reason why I did the first restaurant was, well, I had opened the first PR company for restaurants in London. Mm -hmm. uh, I started in London and when I finished, I didn't want to go back to Monaco. So I, I opened, I was an intern for the, for the first company that does PR for restaurants. That's how I got into the restaurant back door through public relations, press, marketing. And so I was doing PR for Hakkasan for, uh, at the time for it was the Momos, mm -hmm. it was you know, China White, it was a millennial bubble. And uh, so I came back and I started the high-end meat importation. So we started bringing, you know, Japanese, American, South American beef all into Europe, but focalizing in high-end beef. And I, needed a, and I needed a showcase. I needed a place where I could not only explain to my customers what we're trying to do, because we were educating them on marbling, we were educating them on fat, we were edu educating them on tenderness. This doesn't exist in the meat world in Europe. You have to understand that the meat world in Europe is only ratio based on finances. Mm -hmm. It's based on fat, muscles, and yield on the bone. That's how more or less expensive the meat is in Europe, or was. So we had to change the mentality, and ha people have to, we had to, ex ex they had to accept 
to pay fifty dollars a stake, fifty euros a stake. You know, this wasn't normal in the nineteen nineties, ninety nine, two thousand and two, two thousand and three. You would never have a farmer's name on a menu. You would never have a brand of beef on a menu. You would only have fillet or ribeye or that's it. You know, and then talk about all these sauces, which was useless to cover all those tastes. So, it's um. It was a different approach. So I created Beef Bar as a... But was Beef Bar your first restaurant? Yes. Oh, really? Yes. I thought it came out. It was actually called B and C. It was, okay. called, it was BC. Because it was Beef Bar and Capitano. Two restaurants in one. And then one went bankrupt, of course, because we, everybody came and ate only the beef. So we had to change. It was such a funny story. But it was all born out of luck. And, and in the meantime, how many restaurants do you have in Monaco? I have, I have 10 open and four in construction. So 14 uh -huh. in Monaco. I have 10 beef bars in the world and another five beef bar opening next year. So that's why you called the beef boy, yes. basically. Yeah. So when we talk about uh, beef, because at the end of the day, it's quite obvious because it's your family history and, and then you created the, the, the whole hype about it. But when you now look about uh, talk about beef, there's also a lot of, of controversies about oh, yeah. sustainability, it's about flexitarian, it's yeah. about uh, veganism, etc. So in general, not about your concept in specific, how do you see beef in, in the modern world? What, what, what role can it play? Uh, what role will it play? How important can it stay? Because you're in the middle of the field yes. and obviously you have a huge counter trend. Yeah. So how do you see that? There's a huge counter trend, but there's also, um, even within our industry, there's a big movement. You have to know that. First of all, we're very bad at communicating and very bad at communicating and very bad at PR. You know, the meat world has never been good at it. So we suffer a lot from that. But the truth is eat less and eat better. It takes a lot of money to make an animal graze and an animal uh, come to maturity and farmers need to survive. And what we're seeing in places like Australia or even Japan is going to happen probably in Europe. Uh, we're going to have to eat less and we're going to have to eat better. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people are not going to bring big fat supermarket steaks. Oh, talking about ah, beef, here oh, we this go. This is amazing. Here we go. I'm oh, Thank you so much. What is that? What do oh, we have here together? This is my... This is probably the only product I've ever created because I'm not a cook and I can't draw a straight line. But this is the first Kobe beef prosciutto. So what happened was when I received wow. the first shipment of Kobe beef, please try it. I looked, I opened the box. You know, I'm a, I'm a butcher's son, so for me this is incredible. Yes, Kobe true, prosciutto. Yeah. Guys, look at that. Look at that marbling. It's, it's something you've never <laughs> seen in the world. So. So I've, what happened was that I opened the box and it reminded me of the pata negra ham, mm -hmm. raw. And I said, you know what we should do? We should send it either to Spain to get cured or to Italy to get mm -hmm. cured as well. And so I sent one pack to Spain and we did the jamón de buey de Kobe mm -hmm. and we did one prosciutto di Kobe beef. So we have two versions of this. It's not only the most expensive cold cut in the world, but it's the rarest cold cut in the world because we only have 30 hams per month. So how much we're we talking here, kilo? So a restaurant buys this as 400 euros a kilo, which oh. set at 1,200. So that's pure, pure luxury oh, we're this eating is, here. It's, it's not even about the money, it's about no, how no, scarce No, no, luxury in terms of like, uh, yes. Scarce and and you, you said Kobe, you're one of the Kobe ambassadors, correct? Yes, What correct. does that mean? Well, they call us the monitors. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two or three in the world outside of Japan. And we're supposed to, well, we nominate, I'm the Kobe beef monitor for Europe, mm -hmm. not for the rest of the world, just for Europe. So my responsibility is to um, enforce the, the, the values of the Kobe Beef Association and to uh, avoid counterfeits, which means I have to send letters, I have to write, I have to go and visit people that say they sell Kobe beef and they really don't, mostly in restaurants, but mostly it comes from ignorance and not because malicious uh, wrongdoings. So uh, there's a lot of people have, that have confused Wagyu with Kobe. Mm -hmm. So we try to make them understand that, of course, all the Kobe beef is Wagyu, but not all the Wagyu is Kobe. So back on this strand, because before we yes. got interrupted by this really amazing uh, piece prosciutto. of uh, prosciutto. When you now, how you, you said now, okay, it needs to be better quality, you rather eat less but than better. But do you in general in all your restaurants, because you have a wide variety of restaurants, do you adjust to these mega trends? Do you really work now cautiously to put more uh, vegetables, more vegan stuff on, or you say, okay, I have what I have, I stay in my, my field. No, no, I, you... I move, I move. I, I, I mean, I'm, get, I'm doing a leaf bar. So mm -hmm. if you imagine a beef boy, beef bar, doing a leaf bar, so that's another brand diversification. It's going to be a, you know, a plant-loving beef bar. 
So that's that's the motto, and uh, I believe that you know vegetables can be uh, can be seen as real protein, uh, can be seen as uh, center pieces on the plate, mm -hmm. whereas before they were always on the side. Uh, you can evolve, you can do amazing. I mean, look at what California is doing. Look mm -hmm. at also sure. look look at all this new evolution. And I think that if I do it, or if my group does it, it would it would have it would be just more ironic. Uh, but I will do it in a way that it's still meaty. This podcast is brought to you by the Curtis Brothers, creators of artisanal organic ketchup. Guaranteed to tickle the taste buds of foodies, entrepreneurs and teddy bears around the world. Learn more on www.curtisbrothers.com. You understand? Working in the meaty side of the vegetable world. So we're very famous for our street food here. So mm. we do you know, all the street foods of the world. We have eight different chefs. Uh, from all over the world, and they do street food according to their uh, origins. And the same idea will apply to the leaf bar. We're going to have eight chefs doing. Will be Monaco or what? The first one will be in Monaco because okay, I always cool. try to test test the, the concept. Is Monaco a proper test market? It's a proper test kitchen. Test kitchen. Okay. <laughs> so I want to come back to the design because we, before we started, and, and and knowing you now, so for some time you're a quality fanatic, you're hospitality fanatic, but you really, really attached to great design yeah. and all your restaurants have a certain language and up to yeah. details and materials. So tell us uh, about your love to design, where that comes from and, and how you really try to, to implement that in your restaurants. Well, it, it, the, the, the design I I take care of, I give just a direction. I've been working with Amber Poyer since day one, since they were, it's a French, Monaco French uh, company that does, uh, that they're very famous now, but they, we started together. I had no restaurants and, uh, and Emile was an intern. Uh, and so since then we, just, we grew, they became very famous. I grew and I became bigger. Uh, but the idea is really, um, especially when you're talking about a, a meat restaurant, at the time, you, the look was wood, cowboys, hides, mm -hmm. all this. Very dark, very, very um, dark, mm -hmm. heavy, you know, leathers mm -hmm. and Chesterfield uh, couches and all these stereotypes. And we wanted to make it a little, little bit more glamorous. Uh, <laughs> and a, then, a, a, little more <laughs> a little bit more glamorous. <laughs> because I always believe in contrast. Everything mm -hmm. that I do is contrast. My street food is poor recipes with extremely expensive ingredients. This is the same thing. You, you, give, you have a cathedral, but instead of selling, you know, little fish items have great steaks mm -hmm. uh, or... Um, and, and, and that moment when, 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 when the customer has a, 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 an emotion uh, and has a great moment and has a feeling because of all of this, uh, you know, of all, 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 all of this energy, be it from the design, from the menu engineering, to the plates, to, to everything, it's really what d differentiates us. Of course, it's only for a lucky few because we're trying to position this brand at least to the top end of the it's market. At least the top. And I also see and we know that I need to ah, finish yeah. it now that yeah, we... Please finish it. Mm. We have this funny uh, plates here. Yes. T tell us, that's the mochis, correct? And it's yes. your your addition. So this is my collaboration with uh, with Bernardo. Bernardo is one of the Bernardo is one of those uh, porcelain, one of the most iconic and most luxurious um, plate manufacturers. And they, I I, I always wrote on WhatsApp. Uh, with emojis, mm -hmm. and I believe emojis are like a different language. It's, it's again, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little emotion. If you you can have a word, you can have a sentence, yeah, yeah. you can have a, a story, and so also because I wanted to, to desacralize a little bit the space, so I said, let's like, again, let's make it's another contrast. Drink, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's make a good, let's make another contrast, and we did it. And so you're selling them? Yes, online. Okay. And we had so much demand that now we had to. Um, I put a little uh, shop in one of my companies uh, that, and then we, we actually sell it online. They're pretty expensive, but they're really unique, you know, yeah, they they're really amazing. unique. And for every restaurant, we also do two that you can only buy in each location. So they become a bit like collectibles, mm -hmm. like the high-end version of Starbucks mugs. We would do them, <laughs> the down <Bernardo> the <mug. laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, we, we talked about the food, we talked about the design. In, in that league where you play, most important or one of the most important is the hospitality effect. And if we compare the, the big guys in the world, if you, if you uh, see like Danny Myers, the hospitality approach, it all went very far away from the stiff, very right. uh, functional service to very approachable service to edgy service. Yeah. So how you pick these people, how you keep huh. them, um, because obviously if I come here and I pay that amount with a bay, I not expect just great food, I expect a really extraordinary service. And I got it here several times, but how, how, you, how you do that? 
Listen, that's the hardest part of our job. Uh, there is no secret. There's no, there no formula. It's, uh, w my suggestion is picking the right people who can choose the right people. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, they have to love you. So uh, they have to be proud. Uh, they don't do this for, they have to love to serve. So you keep them close? We try to keep them close. Um, we try to, it's a philosophy. And we're trying to look at people that are proud to serve. And then they're not, you know, it's very difficult in Europe, especially in Fran mm. France. You know, the French are very, not the best service you get in France. You know, we know for that. So it's exactly what you said, you know, coming here, uh, trying to change the way they, they think in the service. And most importantly, getting away from the Michelin star and all of this gastronomy in the heart mm. of Avenue Georges Saint in Paris was a real risk. I was not sleeping. I was actually in Bushing yeah? <laughs> two years be year before opening. And all people were sending me pictures and I was trying sure. to lose weight. And it was the most stressful moment of my life. But it's, it's again, it's, it's about having, you know, trusting and putting the right people next to you. And then I'm very lucky. I found three or four guys that have been following me for a long time. And I try to keep it human. Mm -hmm. I try to keep my size also human. Uh, I try to keep it, remember, remember everybody's name. I try to say hello to the last person in the kitchen when I walk into one of my restaurants. They, I think they just, it's simple thing. What they appreciate. That, that mm -hmm. they appreciate. True. You have a lot of different great restaurants, but what we really want to talk about is, is, is your best concept, because that's the beef by where we're sitting here, what you're really growing now worldwide as a yeah. concept. All the other restaurants are also great, so when you're in Monaco, guys, try them all. But the beef bar itself, it, it grew out of Monaco, it was your first restaurant you've yeah. done, now we're sitting in this amazing flagship. How many beef bars exist and what's the plan with it? How you, how you see that brand in two, three years, how you want to grow it? Um, and where you want to I, 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 There's 39 nobles in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there that's are, your benchmark? Yeah, that's very much so. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to grow to, to so much, but uh, at least there is a potential of, of one smaller beef bar, bigger beef or whatever in, in most capitals of the city. So how many are you going to have now? No, well now I have eight or nine open, mm -hmm. but I'm opening the next one in Maribel. Then I'm opening in Sao Paulo, which is going to be mm -hmm. amazing, that one, with Felipe Massa, an old Formula mm -hmm. One driver. So he became a good friend. Uh, then we're opening in Four Seasons in Astir Palace in Athens. Then we're opening in uh, Rome. It's going to be mine in Via Veneto. Milan. Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to say it yet, but it's going to be the most iconic so restaurant in Europe. That one is going to be even as iconic as this one. So we had 15 then, no? Huh? Yeah, something like that. Okay, yeah. and you do that uh, by partners, by... Depends. So either I invest myself with yeah. my friends, or we license, or we manage, or it depends, those three or four models. And how you monitor the quality? Because we're talking, talking about the top league, so it's really tricky. Again, human. It's all so human. You, you are checking yeah, them? Yeah, we have four chefs that just travel the world uh -huh. and check on um, consistency, mm -hmm. and new recipe engineering, and we have three or four people that go around and check the front of house. So I know that you're a very restless person and you always have new ideas and you travel a lot. So now Beef Bar is starting getting, let's say, structured, growing. What, what, what's next for you personally, not on the, on the business side? If you, is there any concept in you where you say, even if I don't make money, this is what I like to do? Yes, or is there yes, another yes. field I, what I, you I, like I, to I, explore? I, no, no, no. I think I found what I like to do. Uh -huh. um, I also, I'm very creative and mm -hmm. I, I have as much pleasure in... I, I, I do most of my recipes with my chef, but I initiate the idea. And so the, this pleasure, it's like, you know, a lot of people ask me this question and um, my real deal, and you know this, my, one of my strongest goals is to make, you know, a millennial concept, a super affordable, super conceptual. So scale that down. Scale that down and do, the, do, them, do them everywhere. Uh, I believe that uh, there's room for that. I can do it from the farmer to the table, no middleman. And uh, I've been working a lot on these con this evolution of the concept and I think it's going to be uh, great. I also believe in uh, extending the beef bar brand, making it into a beef bar umbrella brand. And mm -hmm. then, as I said, the leaf bar, I'm doing a beef barbecue, which is going to be all over the Korean mm -hmm. barbecue, but all of, only of uh, marinades from all over the world. It's not gonna stay Korean only, it's going to be worldwide. I'm doing a beef bar burger, which is um, super cool as well. I might do this one here. 
it's going to be a, like a butcher shop, you know, our amazing mm -hmm. butcher shop. So we walk in, it's the same thing, but we mince the meat in front of you and then we oh, make the burger. Great. It's never been done. So we just mince the meat, cho choose between four or five meats, and we stuff them with ingredients. And then we... And, and besides growing the beef, but do you want to realize any other concepts? Is there any more place in Monaco for something else? Oh yes, or in I have Paris? so many concepts. I, I, again, I, it has... But is there still room or you're just cannibalizing yourself? In, Mon in Monaco, there's not so much room. So, so Paris we, it is. So we try to, well, we try to take different segments. Mm -hmm. uh, so because I do restaurants from 150 euros per person up to five euros per person. And again, it's not, about, it's not about the luxury, it's about the creativity and it's about the success. My restaurant dream would be people queuing outside. This podcast is brought to you by the Curtis Brothers, creators of artisanal organic ketchup. Guaranteed to tickle the taste buds of foodies, entrepreneurs and teddy bears around the world. Learn more on www.curtisbrothers.com Doesn't matter if it's cheap. Once they queue out of the beef, but then we... No, then this, this doesn't happen. We <laughs> don't want them to queue outside of the beef. This please, will not please, happen. Please. No, no, this so cannot happen. When you we look back now, uh, you, you talked about all, all these this, this, uh, milestones. How much you think it was luck and how much you think it was hard work? If you find a balance on, on, on being honest good, to good yourself. Good question. Uh, first of all, if I'd never had the support from my family, who had enough money to make me invest, I would never have done anything. If they were not here also to cover my ass when I lost a lot of money, because everybody sees the good sides, but they don't know mm -hmm. how much money you lose sometimes in other ventures or even restaurants. Um, so I was lucky in that term that I, I had them. But it was not luck, it was objectivity. It was the fact that they could help me out once you fall. And a lot of people had only one chance And I, I was lucky enough to have more. So I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, all the rest is hard work. All the rest is hard work. And, and if you need to describe yourself, you, because you, you're not really a chef, you're not really a designer, you're like, you, you're really giving the impulse to all the people around you. What are you, like the, the puppet yes, player? I always take the, or, I, I always take the, 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 the example of a, a fashion, you know, the artistic director in a fashion house, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to compare myself to someone like Lagerfeld, of course, but he would, he could draw, but he wouldn't. And uh, I can't cook, but I give the input. I see the vision in the beginning, I give the theme, mm -hmm. but I cannot execute. I cannot draw a straight line, I can't cook an egg, but I can make this prosciutto, mm -hmm. you know? So um, it's all about putting people together, ideas together. That's really what I do. And you do good. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we air this, we always get the question, you, you always uh, spend so much time with people in the industry, ask them about the best places, the best restaurants. So I always get the comments and I need to do it. If not, I always write down that I don't forget. So um, obviously I need to ask you, best steak in the world outside of the beef bar, where did you have it? Where, where, where would you send people to really have an outstanding steak experience, if not the beef bar? Um, I don't know if it's really important if it's steak or meat. Meat. Okay. It's the black label burger at Mineta Tavern in New York. Okay. I will always remember that dry aged burger. They're the only ones, I love dry aged beef. I uh -huh. didn't like it. I'm becoming a bit more a fan. Uh -huh. And they've done the best. It just, it just I, I nearly would fly just to New York to have a burger and come back. Oh, that's a good tip. And if you think about overall restaurants experience, because we said it's a mix of design, it's a mix of food, it's a, it's a mix of hospitality. If you need to pick any place where you feel comfortable, where you go with your friend, with your family, if you step outside of your own restaurants or you visit a, a restaurant of a friend, what's your, what's your favorite place to you, be? You mean like a chain? No, uh, whatever. Or, or, or a restaurant where you really go there to feel comfortable. N nothing for you to say that's, that's the best uh, high end, but where you say this is my home out of my own chains where you oh, feel comfortable oh that's a very tough question because i always go to my restaurants i want to feel home okay um, um i would probably say i never go often but i would probably say to 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 to, to go to a big mama restaurant here in paris you like the big yes. mama oh um, um, i am totally um in synthony where they're When I was talking before about the concept I want yeah. to multiplicate, it's exactly that, making a big mum, but beef oriented. So yes, I, I think they got it exactly right. You know, They understood what millennials want. 
And I'm, though I'm old, but my children are young. And I should talk about how old are your kids? Three and five. So how how you raise them? Because we talked about how your parents raised you. So how how you raise them in regards of? <laughs> no, I mean, you, tra- so you, you, you travel a lot. You have a crazy lifestyle. Uh, you circle around design and yeah. food. How, what do you want to pass on to them? It's just, very just, early for just, them. I just want to pass on uh, my values, my simple values. Uh, it's very difficult for them to grow up. Uh, I know how difficult Monaco can be on kids. Um, I'm trying since 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 I've hired more people to travel less. So uh, I try not to move so much and be home much more. And I'm enjoying home is Monaco or home Paris? Home Monaco. Monaco. But we bring them to Paris. I've got a little apartment here, so we bring them here sometimes uh, to travel more, spend time with them a lot. But now they go to school, so it's mostly on try, try to stay with them on their holidays and, and stuff like that. And of course at night, I have dinner with them or all the weekends with them. And nice. No, it's really nice. I'm very, I'm very happy, very lucky. Yeah. At the end, I want to thank you because you helped me two times. First of all, we, we really became great friends and, and, and for everybody, I, I had really problem and I gained the weight a lot. And, and I remember that you told me you have this place where you go and I called you and said, Ricardo, I need your help. And then you sent me to yes. this detox slash fasting clinic uh, of uh, our friends at Puchinger. And then yes. it really started. Uh, since then, I lost 22 kilos. Yes, I was telling you. Thanks to you. Still going on? Um, I'm, I'm now at 90. I stopped eating. So this is the first bite of meat I had for four months. I'm, I'm a vegetarian since four months. Okay. But obviously today, having but a today, vacuum battle. On, yeah, I, I will. But it really was an impulse. And the second thing is you helped me a lot oh, with this project. Thank you, yes. And I'm really looking forward to, to everything what we maybe do. We cannot disclose a lot, but we, yes, we're thinking. To. And tonight we're going to have a great party. So at the so. end, because they also will see the movie about tonight. So yeah. we are here before, so we don't know yet what's going to happen. But maybe you can say what is planned to happen tonight, because very special event. Well, um, I found, so one day I was in, um, I was in, I was in Kobe, in Hyogo Prefecture. Mm-hmm. And I was invited by the, 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 the government to give a little speech on how I thought uh, the, the, the vision of my vision of Kobe in Europe, boring stuff. And I met this guy, this crazy guy, whose name was Hisato, had a company called Wagyu Mafia. Great name. And that did, without knowing, he did exactly what I've done. I've done street food with Kobe beef. He's done street food, Japanese street food with Kobe beef. And so we were in complete synthony together, but we, we, without having even met. And then we became friends. Of course, he's super famous now in Japan and is very media friends. He's super Instagrammable, loves all of this. But um, so it's the first time that his five best recipes and my five best recipes wow. are served at the same time. So nobody knows what's going to happen. <laughs> so that's tonight. tonight and tomorrow oh, wow. we're doing for three sessions. Okay, and yeah. and then and that's then a on, unique. And, uh, yes. That's it. And then on Saturday, yeah, in my other small restaurant called Anai, yeah, he's doing his Kobe beef, o- Ozaki beef, I think, ramen, amazing wow. ramen only. But that's the great thing in our industry that we can work together, we become friends together because it's not so much about competition; it's about sharing, yeah. having fun, and. And, and it's great. I'm it's really great. looking I mean, forward I, it's, to that. It, you know, it's, it's the ultimate luxury in the coolest of settings with the sim- simple ingredients ever. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to yes. tonight and the daddy too. So let's let's cheer. Thank, Thank you for you your so time. Much. Because Thank now you. you need Look, to prepare. Look, Bakara is following if, us. Even Bakara. <laughs> it's true, they're supporting our event. Uh, guys, <laughs> if, if, if you're in Paris, Monaco, visit one of Ricardo's restaurants. It's really, really uh, amazing. Uh, get one of these uh, am- <laughs> amazing brochures. Try to get one. And, and stay here because we're going to show you now what's going to happen tonight. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay tuned on www.teddytalkswith.com.